<laughs> Our beloved community of faith, reason, and affection welcomes all to grow in mind and spirit as together we build a better world. If you're joining us for the first time this morning, we extend a special welcome and invite you to fill out our online visitor card so you can receive more information about Emerson and our activities. And I see that that has just been put in the chat. Thank you. Uh, again, welcome to all. We are a church in many places. And due to the Omicron surge, today we're coming to you from our homes, connecting digitally to reduce each community's COVID risks. You'll notice that we've muted you, which helps all of us to hear the service better. And we encourage you to use the chat box. Following the worship service, we'll have social time which is a chance for you to gather in smaller groups to discuss the service and what's going on in your lives. Our interim minister, Reverend Michelle Legrave, leads worship today with assistance from me and our music director, Julia Mercer and Emersonian Dory Wolf on tech support. Uh, thank you so much, Dory. Uh, and now it's time for our prelude, which is just as you are, by Leon Morris. This song was inspired by my oldest daughter. Just as you are without changing the thing, just as you are, I accept you. I see you, I hear you, I welcome you in just as you are, just as you are, just as you are without changing a thing, just as you are, I accept you, I see you, I hear you, I welcome you in just as you Good morning, everyone. I am the Reverend Michelle Legrave, the interim minister of this congregation. Today, we continue exploring the values you identified last spring as the congregation's core values with the value of welcoming. This morning's service will look and feel a little different with you doing more of the exploring. And for all of you introverts out there, don't worry, it's okay just to be quiet and listen to. Whoever you are, wherever you come from, 
wherever you find yourself on your life's journey, no matter your age, whichever your pronouns, whether you've walked in or rolled in or dialed in, whatever marginalized and privileged identities you hold, whether you're here for the first time or the fifth or the 500th, whether English is your first language or your second or your third or more, whether you are a citizen or not, or hope to be one someday, whomever you love, you, whoever you are, are welcome here. Let us enter into the circle of energy and love. All are welcome here. We are an inclusive community of faith and kindness, memory and hope. All are welcome here. a community with a deep and abiding trust in the promise of goodness in every human heart and soul. All are welcome here. We are a community of quest where we gather to study and search. All are welcome here. We are a community of service where the gifts we give and receive are compassion, forgiveness, gratitude, and devotion. All are welcome here. We are a community of joy and laughter where the worth of every individual is celebrated. All are welcome here. We light this chalice for all who are here and all who are not, for all who have ever walked through our doors, for those who may yet find the spiritual home, and for those we can't even yet imagine. For each of us and for us all, may this flame burn warm and bright. And now we have our opening hymn, number 360, Here We Have Gathered. Oh uh -huh. 
tell you about the hungry coat. Mullah Nasruddin was a wise, scholarly theologian. He was also a hard-working, industrious farmer. And one day, during the Feast of Ramadan, he was working hard on his farm. As the sun was beginning to set, his stomach was beginning to grumble, and his mind was already somewhat in the future because one of the wealthiest members of his community had invited everyone to come and gather for a feast to break the fast on this evening. Mullah Nasruddin could already almost taste the figs, the chicken, the beef, the lentils, all of the good and delicious things that would be spread on that table for everyone to share and enjoy. The only problem was that he had worked so long and so hard that it was almost time to gather for the feast already. If he went home to wash himself and change his clothes, he'd be late. So he decided he would go directly from working in the fields to the feast. When he arrived at the door, a servant answered and immediately noticed his dirty, tattered, worn work clothes. They also recognized his face and they let him in, but with some reluctance and certainly without a word of welcome. Mullah Nasruddin arrived at the feast at the table where all the other members of the community were gathered and they Likewise, looked him over, scornfully, questioning. None of them issued a, a welcome, a hello. No one moved aside to make space for him at the table. They noticed his clothes, and they continued their conversations. So he, he grabbed a plate, and he reached between people to choose the food that he wanted and the things that he had been so excited about eating. There were the figs and the chicken and the beef and the lentils that he had been counting on all day. But somehow once he had his food, his appetite was gone. But being a wise and scholarly man, he put his plate down in the corner and went home. He washed himself. He dressed and he put on his finest coat, a coat with many pockets, many colors made of silk. One that the members of the community had commented on before. And indeed, when he returned, the servant opened the door and looked favorably upon his coat and said, my, Mullah Nasruddin, you're looking fine this evening. We're glad that you could join us. Please come in. When Mullah Nasruddin came to the table in his clean and fancy dress. Well, a few people moved aside and, and invited him to sit next to them and asked how his day had been and offered him some of the delicious foods that were spread on the table. Well, this time, the mullah saw the figs and put one into his pocket and said, eat, coat, eat, enjoy. And he reached out for some nuts and he put those into another pocket and said, eat coat, eat. He wasn't so sure about putting chicken or beef in his coat and maybe lentils either, but there were some dates and he put those into his coat's pocket and said, eat coat, enjoy, enjoy the meal. Finally, the host of the feast had watched enough and silenced all the conversation and addressed the mullah directly. Mullah Nasruddin, lovely that you could be with us this evening. Why are you putting food into your coat pockets? And the mullah replied, yes, thank you so much for the kind and generous invitation. I am merely feeding my coat 
because I realized that when I came before in my dirty work clothes, that I was not really welcome at this table. But when I returned in my fine clothing, in my fancy coat, that I was suddenly seen. And that helped me understand that it is not I who am welcome at this feast, but my coat. This story challenges us when we state an intention to open our communities, our homes, our hearts, our lives, to widen our circles, that we need to search ourselves and be aware of the places where we might be keeping others out, that we get to choose to welcome in those who others might turn away. And in fact, to be radical in our acceptance. This story inspired this song. Who is my neighbor and who is my friend? Who do I welcome to step right on in? I comfort with all of my love. May it be said of me that the answer is everyone. Let them in. Let them in. The hungry and the ragged who've been tossed off by the wind. Giving out of what is our own is a transformative act. As a community of faith, we collect an offering, not for ourselves or our congregation, but to give to others as a collective action of our community and as a way to live out our shared values. Please give with a generous heart to support the January Share the Plate recipient, the UU Afghan Refugee Project. Emerson, First UU, and Northwoods have teamed up to assist an Afghan refugee family newly arrived in Houston. The family consists of Ghul Hamid, Iklas Bibi, and their six children, ages 14 and under. As well as providing funds, we're working with our English language learning team, and to learn more ways you can help, talk with Ellen Norton after the service and see our weekly e-blast. And as always, 25% of our offering will go to Interfaith Ministries Meals on Wheels, feeding Houston seniors. We have three ways to give. You can text the number on the screen that will be up in just a moment. Go to our webpage for online giving. Or if you prefer to mail a check, yes, we're still picking up mail at church.
Please find a comfortable place to be. Place your feet flat on the floor if you can and if you will. Close your eyes if you feel comfortable doing so and take a deep breath in. And join me in a spirit a meditation followed by a time of silence. You are beloved here and you are welcome here. Whether tears have fallen from your eyes this past week or gleeful laughter has spilled out of your smiling mouth, you are beloved and you are welcome here. Whether you are feeling brave or brokenhearted, defiant or defeated, fearsome or fearful, you are beloved and you are welcome here. Whether you have untold stories buried deep inside or stories that have been forced beyond the edges of comfort. You are beloved and you are welcome here. Whether you have made promises, broken promises, or are renewing your promises, you are beloved and you are welcome here. Whatever is on your heart, however it is with your soul in this moment, you are beloved and you are welcome here. In this space of welcome and acceptance, commitment and recommitment, of covenant and connection, you are beloved and you are welcome here. Let us enter into the silence together. Amen and blessed be. This morning, we continue the exploration of the five core values this congregation identified last spring. Caring, community, integrity, welcoming, and ministry. Over the course of this past fall and continuing this winter, we are essentially taking the time to focus on one core value a month through story and song and worship. 
Today we are focusing on exploring the value of welcoming. And to do so, we are going to tap your wisdom. Most of you will have lived experience of feeling welcome or not so welcome, a feeling moved to join in or join with or not. What is it that through your own experience you already know? In just a moment, you will be invited to move into breakout sessions to explore this question in a smaller group. All are welcome to share or not as you feel moved and comfortable doing so. Speak up, type in the chat, reflect in silence, or simply listen in, whatever works for you on this morning and in this setting. If you prefer, you can remain in the main session, turn your video off, and spend time in quiet contemplation, writing, sketching, doing whatever it is that feels right for you now, today. As always, be sure to share time and space. The question we will be exploring for the next 12 minutes is, think of a time when you felt extraordinarily welcome. The setting doesn't matter. It could have been at a person's home, a community event, a church, or any other number of places. What was it about this experience that made you feel especially welcome? So the, once again, the question is, where the directions are, think of a time when you felt extraordinarily welcome. The setting doesn't matter. It could have been at a person's home, a community event, a church, or any number of other places. What was it about this experience that made you feel especially welcome? Once everyone has returned to the main group, all those who feel moved to do so will be invited to share their own experience in the whole group chat. Now, in just a moment, you should have appear on your screen an invitation to join a group. I think that there are three types of welcoming experiences. One is when we feel welcome. The another one is when we feel uncomfortably welcome. And the last is when we don't feel welcome at all. I don't know about you, but I've had experiences with all three. I think one of my favorite welcoming experiences happened at Star Island. For those of you who do not know, Star Island is a UUA camp and conference center that is an island off the coast of New Hampshire that we share with the UCC, United Church of Christ. And every summer there are uh, specific weeks with different kinds of programming. And um, I have been to the one that was about religious education, UU religious education. So in order to get there, first of all, we had to get on a ferry, ride over to the island, and know that we were going to be on the island for a week and there was no getting off until the end of the week. As soon as I arrived, there were people waiting right there at the dock and they had been assigned all the newbies. So for those of us for whom it was our first time arriving on the island, we got a 
star buddy. We got name tags so that everyone knew who everyone else was and we had a star buddy who checked in with us throughout the week and made sure that we were doing okay and answered any questions we had about how things work on the island and um, that was incredibly reassuring and welcoming. I think they still do that today. The second kind of experience is one of being uncomfortably welcomed. I have had this one as well. For me, this happened at a small Unitarian Universalist church, and it was very obvious when we came into the church that we were the brand new folks. Everyone stared at us. Everyone turned around to look. Everyone came over to introduce themselves. Everyone was so excited to see the new 20-somethings show up at the church. And it was a bit much. Another uncomfortably welcome experience, and this happened a lot at a lot of different UU churches. This is kind of a popular thing to do, is to have special coffee mugs for the people who are brand new that are a different color or have a stripe or something like that. And then you hold this coffee cup and people know you're new and they're supposed to come over and talk to you. So of course that doesn't always work. Sometimes people don't come over and talk to you. But even worse, for those of us who don't drink coffee, you either have to hold a drink full of coffee that you're not gonna drink or an empty mug <laughs> or figure out what to do with your hands. And that was just, that was kind of uncomfortable. The third experience at all and that's happened on multiple occasions where I've gone into a dining hall for some kind of special event and found people sitting at tables with a lot of empty chairs that they have tipped forward to indicate that they are saving it for someone else to sit at the table. And then it becomes really challenging to find a table to sit at where there's an empty space and no tipped chairs. The results of those kinds of experiences vary. When you get a welcome that really feels like a wonderful, comfortable welcome, it is easy to join that community with joy. When you get an uncomfortable welcome, it requires a certain amount of stick to from the person who wants to join the community to make it actually work. Not everybody has that stick to but if someone really wants to join the community, they can manage. The third one is one of not being welcome at all. And in that case, people don't join at all. People are not welcomed at all, they don't join. You may have noticed that as people shared their experiences of feeling welcome, to make this even more complicated, the same experience might not have worked for you. These differences are important to note. And also the fact that sometimes these different kinds of welcoming experiences happen in the same setting, depending on which small group of people you are interacting with. Another important thing to explore I think, are the ways in which our identities matter. For example, as a queer woman with a spouse who most of the time passes as a cisgender male, being seen as just the same as a person is heterosexual can actually lead to my feeling unseen and with an important cultural identity being unraced and it feels unwelcoming. This is probably similar to what people of color experience when white people tell them that they don't see skin color. As human beings, as much as there are many ways in which we are all alike, there are also many ways in which we are all different. 
We are all alike and we are all different. And any welcome that does not hold both realities is not really a welcome. We humans have a need to feel welcome in both our similarities and in our differences, just the way we already are. Dear one, we have received your letter and we hate to tell you, not hate so much, but are a bit afraid to say, we cannot grant your requests as stated, but can only remind you of familiar things. First, faith. Faith in yourself and trust in others. We know it can be terrifying to be vulnerable, but only when you share your softest side will we be able to break through. Next, hope. Hope is not an empty fairy tale. It is the true story of all the times human beings like you have found a way to create the future, though you didn't know how. And of course, love. Love that demands you cherish all people, not just yourself and safety. Love that is not satisfied until every argument ends abruptly when one child says, that hurts. There is so much to learn and relearn. The world teaches you to be hard, to negotiate and defend, to avoid giving too much and to the wrong people. There are no wrong people. You also are not wrong. And when you encounter the poor, the broken, the unhoused and unwelcome, you are looking, if you pay attention, at us, calling to you, calling you to answer your own prayers. If you want to change the world, first, be sure you are changing yourself. Be tender, be kind, be at peace, be all the things you wish for, be your own better self. It isn't without cost, but it will be free. My hands are strong enough, they're strong enough, and I'm good enough. My hands are strong enough to give love. I know that I My arms are long enough, they're long I enough, and I'm good my enough. My arms are long enough, long enough to give love. love. I know that I My arms are long enough, they're long enough, and I'm good enough. enough. My heart is wide enough, it's wide enough, I'm good enough. My heart is wide enough, to get love. 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 My arms are long enough to give you love. My hands are strong enough to give you love. Sean tells us that if you want to change the world, you must first change yourself. And Leah tells us that her hands and your hands and all of our hands are good enough to do the work. The first question is, what is the work? Pastor Laura Gorowin has something to say about that. And while she is speaking of white mainline churches, not Unitarian Universalist congregations, our traditions are similar enough. Here's what she says. Our white mainline churches want new members far more than people want to become members of white mainline churches. 
There are just simply are not thousands of people out there just waiting for an invitation to serve on committees, hang out in a church fellowship hall, and join us for the kind of worship we prefer. If people wanted to be part of our churches as they are now, they would be. They wouldn't have left. So we have a choice. We can either accept our dwindling budgets and numbers, or we can ask if there is something we could be that potential members would value. There is a huge cultural divide between those who have stayed in our white denominational churches and those who have left or never come. Which is more important to us, our church culture or the people who are alienated by it? My experience is that there are deeply marginalized people who would love a congregation to truly welcome them in, but we insist on doing it on our terms, not theirs, which is further alienating. Can we accept and mourn that the church culture we like is something we have to give up if we want a vibrant community of faith? My suspicion is that if we can do this, our faith will be revived and deepened by those who will join us. We will lose the comfort of what we have known, but we will gain something so much more. Abundant life. There is no doubt in my mind that all of you here today, new members, visitors, old timers alike, all believe in being welcoming and may even want to become more welcoming both here at church and in other aspects of your lives but how how do we go about it how do we change the world ourselves what do we do with our hands and our hearts and our words these are the questions we will explore in our second breakout session the same things apply now as before, 12 minutes, you can remain in the main session, all of that. Here's what we're going to, here's your assignment, what we're going to discuss. In your group, brainstorm together some practical ideas you will do to help people feel more welcome here at Emerson. Keeping in mind, not everyone likes to be welcomed in the same way. And these ideas might require the culture at Emerson to change. If you are new or visiting with us today, what might help you to feel more welcome here? And I will share one welcoming story that I love about a church about your size, actually a tiny bit bigger than your size, that um, had a group of young adults who, um, most of whom who had not really felt super welcome in the congregation. They weren't really involved. They weren't really tapped for leadership. Um, they were present and organized as a group. And um, at some point, some conversations about welcoming in the congregation happened. And they decided that since they had not felt super welcome, they would take it upon themselves to organize and look out every service. There were two services every Sunday to see if there were any people who appeared to be around that age and might be interested in a young adult group and took turns welcoming them at coffee hour, social hour, letting them know such a thing as a young adult group existed and inviting them to join the group if they were interested in doing so. So there are lots of different ways that we could welcome people that we can learn to help people join us. And um, 
Our leanings and our learnings are certainly a blessing in our lives. These values that we are exploring, that we are learning to live into, these are the way that we live our faith out loud. They remind us of who we are and they communicate with the world, both who we are as individuals and as a congregation and who we are in the process of becoming. May it be so. Amen and blessed be. Now let us join together in singing our closing hymn. Since we're on Zoom, this is one of the blessings of Zoom. We're all on mute and we can sing as loudly as we want without masks on. <laughs> Go forth from this place with hands and hearts and arms wide open, welcoming in all those who would join us on the quest for what is good and true and worthy, blessing all others as you yourselves are blessed. Amen and blessed be. I have a pastoral message for you all today. We've had some tragic and some sad news in our congregation. I want to share with you that the grandchildren of Lane and Michael Devereaux, who are one and two and uh, three years old, Kevin and Hayden Lee, 
died in a fire earlier this week. Their mother survived, Victoria, and she, she's injured, but she survived, and um, she's returned to Houston with Lane and Michael. I hope that you will hold them all in your hearts and thoughts and prayers. I also want to share with you that Barbara Hopkins, the wife of Bob Hopkins, died this week as well. And while I don't normally uh, share the deaths of public figures, I'm going to make an exception in this case and uh, honor the life of Thich Nhat Hanh. For all of these people who have died and all of these who remain alive and are in deep grief and mourning, we hold you in our hearts and thoughts and prayers.